A couple of housekeeping, not really housekeeping, but just some uh, a question and uh, a couple of points I don't want to forget is that um, in the last couple of months, we've planted 54 Gary Oaks on our property. Wow. Uh, we have uh, one gallon pots of one year old oaks, you know, not much to look at as you know, this time of year. But if some of you or someone you know could use uh, one, two, three, four, uh, we're <laughs> happy to share maybe up to a half a dozen or a dozen. Uh, we can use some uh, some of your brochures for membership. I really want to commit to trying to get it, you know, a few members this year. Uh, not we don't have a lot of traffic. Like nobody has traffic, right, in their businesses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we still actually do get a few that stroll by. And then the I I missed what Kyle said. Uh, brochures about invasive ivy, or did I totally hear something wrong? Well, yeah, we designed a, a flyer for homeowners uh, who have trees that are infested with ivy, just some kind of uh, overview directions on how to remove the ivy from their trees and then um, the gentle suggestion to remove the ivy completely from their yard and replant with native plants. Excellent. And that's on the website now. I will be soon along with uh, another book report from our resident writer, Brian Giles. Excellent, very pertinent. Um, okay, well, the Pacific Rim Institute uh, is a private nonprofit organization. Uh, most of you probably know that. And uh, Laura asked me to uh, talk a little bit about Golden Paintbrush and I, I just wanna put, quickly put it in perspective. Uh, the ocean is a lot closer than it seems when you're standing on the ground. <laughs> All we see are trees. But uh, this is looking northeast from uh, an aerial view uh, taken in the early 1980s. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. Yes. Okay, you can see all this flight netting. Mm -hmm. All this flight netting all the way out here to this section, which was never, uh, you can see massive amounts of snowberry rose uh, and grape around a sentinel fir. And this is what we call our remnant prairie. Uh, it took a person five minutes to find 15 rare species on that land around the time that the game farm, this was a pheasant farm since 1946, um, uh, around the time they were looking to sell the place. And uh, fast forward, we've removed over, uh, and we meaning volunteers mostly, but staff uh, have removed over 11 miles of buried fencing buried two feet deep and going up six, seven feet tall. And imagine all the flight netting over this and the posts and everything else and cable. We've taken off five, um, over five ton, uh, five, uh, 500 tons of material off the uh, property. Wow. Uh, much of it to be reused and recycled, uh, mm -hmm. but some of it we weren't able to do that with. So uh, Whidbey has three, basically three prairies, and we're down to less than a percent of what there used to be, uh, just geologically speaking, a blink of an eye ago. Uh, and uh, we're located on Smith Prairie here. And this is uh, one of the LIDAR maps, fascinating to see the glacial outwash uh, aspects. Uh, prairies, as again, probably preaching to the choir here, uh, metaphorically, uh, you know that, um, uh, the prairies were, were kept, anthrop they're anthropogenic almost exclusively, uh, human created and maintained for millennia. And uh, they, uh, fire was a key tool. Uh, one of the aspects of the degradation of our landscape in the last couple hundred years is basically because when the Euro-Americans moved here, fire went from being absolutely critical and life-sustaining to something to be avoided at all costs. And that dramatically changed the entire landscape and lifescape. But um, the uses of prairie plants go far beyond this chart. And I, I don't know if you can read it, but medicine, food, materials, charms, uh, ceremony are the top categories, but there's many, many, many uses. And you can see almost 35 documented uh, uses of native prairie plants for medicinal purposes uh, by Collins and uh, um, Eby and others. 
Uh, we've got a lot of smaller residents that we may, may or may not think about, but we actually have amphibians uh, and we have them on Whidbey Island. But uh, uh, key ones uh, that inhabit uh, our area here in the Puget Sound and on our site, uh, shrews, alligator lizards, Pacific tree frogs, salamander, little brown bat. Uh, the three key players for our prairie and our restoration are the Townsend's Bowl. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one of these before. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, we had 18 of them out in the prairie. It's just, it's crazy. And of course, pollinators of all types and sizes and shapes. And, uh, but um, we're involved, obviously, in restoring our lands, and we want to And to do that, we realize we have to restore our relationship with the land. And you can't have a relationship with something or someone if you don't spend time, uh, listen, <laughs> observe, and uh, be humble. Of course, anybody who's married, right? Uh, but uh, that's uh, really what's involved. Is is the, it, it really? It's about relationships and and reconciling relationships where uh, in many cases, you know, a lot of the degradation is because of, of human uh, action or indifference or ignorance. Uh, but um, uh, there is hope, there's definitely hope. And our perspective, why we're created is that we're, we believe we're, we're called to be stewards. Uh, this comes from our faith. We obviously work with uh, everybody across the spectrum. In fact, my best friends around the planet are Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. But, but uh, uh, we, we see stewardship as caring for something that belongs to someone else. And uh, it's about fruitfulness and, and utility. Uh, it definitely, if we can engage people on a utilitarian aspect of something and then work with that to not to say we have all the answers and all the knowledge that we're just dispensing this wisdom on, on these poor unsuspecting neighbors, but um, because we learn constantly with these engagements, but uh, where you can engage, that's where you engage and, and you go from there. And sometimes people just see board feet of lumber uh, and they don't see a forest or something like that. And that's even a, a starting point, but um, uh, and also the connection to the greater Puget Sound. Clearly, the, uh, even the connections on Whidbey Island now are broken. The three par prairies don't connect anymore. And uh, so there's this isolation. We have some species that there's about four species of uh, relatively rare native plants that the only place they grow on Whidbey Island that's known to anybody, and, and some of you are, and you may know some, serious botanizers, I call them drive-by botanists who, you know, are constantly have their nose out the window going down the side roads to see if there's some white fawn lily in someone's ditch or something like that. And that's great. And the best that I can get from, you know, not 100% sure, but from people who have spent decades doing this, uh, we have a few that the only place they exist now on our site, and we know some of them are clearly inbred and or uh, have lost their pollinator. And so the only way we can propagate them is vegetatively. Uh, we never get fertile seeds from them. That, the example I'm speaking of here is the uh, Howell's lily, which is the Tritelia, Tritelia grandiflora variety Howellii, stunning plant. But uh, we've got camas and, and spring gold here over to the left with some buttercup as well. And uh, Last year, July 9th, uh, January 9th was the first bloom of our, of our spring gold, uh, but this year we haven't found any yet. Doesn't mean it's not out there hiding somewhere, but it's an early bloomer. It's great. And uh, like dandelions, which are not native, uh, it's an early uh, source of uh, uh, nectar for uh, the early pollinators. And then, of course, this golden paintbrush down here on the lower right, that's the Castilea levisecta and it's related to the red paintbrush or the scarlet paintbrush or the Indian paintbrush, uh, which is Castilea miniata. There's another one that's stunningly gorgeous, Castilea hispida, and it's native and it's called harsh paintbrush. Uh, maybe it's harshly beautiful, but it um, crosses with the golden paintbrush. So therein uh, lies another conundrum that at least early 
joiners into is starting to learn about you know basic restoration and things might find odd but we've actually removed castilea hispida from our property five or six plants that have come up and uh just because uh it's it's much more common and uh the golden paintbrush is on the endangered species list so um if golden paintbrush were just from the tip of the southern end of the island all the way up to the north and all over the mainland and were as common as quack grass, then you know we wouldn't worry about the hispida. Any questions or comments there? Robert, um, I have one. What conditions do does uh, golden paintbrush want to have? You know, what kind of soils, et cetera, moisture? Right. Dry open areas, uh, primarily not a lot of um, uh, clay in the soil. Our place is perfect. It's a glacial outwash prairie and, uh, you know, water takes a long time to get down to the aquifer, which is about 180 feet, give or take, around here. But uh, it, a lot less time than in other places. Uh, we have, it, it's just uh, um, uh, a high perk area. We have, we have some topsoil here <laughs> and it ranges from one inch to about 18 inches thick. And it uh, below that is sand and then light gravel and then large gravel. We have parts of our area where the large, uh, not large gravel, uh, rocks and larger, you know, uh, football size stones are right at the surface. Um, but it likes the uh, wet, cold winters and the dry summers. That's how it thrives. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, overall, our prairie enhancement strategies or, or even creation, if you will, when you're starting from just a completely degraded field of maybe nothing but scotch broom and, and a few other invasive species, uh, we do controlled burns. We were able to do one this year again. Uh, we mow, uh, we work at keeping encroaching forests and noxious weeds at bay. Uh, we have uh, uh, objective and subjective uh, protocols and strategies for dealing with uh, uh, non-native species. Some of them were like, it's fine, the larvae of the, this butterfly likes to use it as a food source, and it's not noxious or highly invasive. So we are making um, you know, human-level decisions at our local landscape level on saying, well, we, we very strongly prioritize scotch broom removal, uh, partly because we only have four or five plants that keep popping up in the same little two square meters on the property. Mm -hmm. And we're just trying to exhaust the seed bank there. And, and you know, my great grandchildren will finish it off, hopefully, <laughs> but because um, the seeds last so long in the soil. But uh, we sometimes do harrowing. Uh, we do use chemicals from time to time. Uh, cover cropping and uh, animal agriculture. And we have run sheep out here. We want to, we're talking with a few people about possibly doing some very controlled, very specific scientific rotational grazing with ruminants, uh, maybe even pigs uh, to start to root out an area and, and uh, get it uh, more well prepared and suited for seeding with native species that could be combined with some less noxious or less wildly invasive pasture species and serve dual purpose. Have, a, have a, a reservoir of native plants there that at least aren't toxic. They may not be preferable. Some of them are uh, and can be nutritious, but uh, there's some combinations there. So part of our restoration is, uh, I mean, it, all of it is focused on living now and what can we do to survive and thrive indefinitely into the future. That's sort of the sustainability definition we're looking at, the social, cultural, economic things that we can do now uh, to have our landscape and lifescape uh, not only survive, but thrive in the future and indefinitely. I know that's a subjective term, but uh, you know, I remember being in the development world back uh, starting in the late 70s, early 80s, and everybody was going to end world hunger, uh, major diseases and everything else by 2020, because that was a really nice number and it was far out enough that it was believable and realistic. And uh, it's not a criticism really. Uh, uh, it's actually in some cases, there were very heroic efforts, but 
But my point is that um, uh, we can try to set into stage and even use legal means like uh, um, uh, conservation easements and such. Uh, but even there, not even a conservation easement can't guarantee that the next landowners will care, uh, have a heart, um, have a degree of competence or anything else. Uh, not that we're the sole proprietors of competence by any means, but uh, I think you get you get my point on that. Hey, any questions, I, comments on that? Yeah, the harrowing. How does I don't know really what you mean by that or how oh, it works. Right. Yes. Well, it has different meanings and that's my mistake. Uh, you can use a, a, an implement called a spring tooth harrow, which is just basically curved uh, uh, metal tong or tines that are pulled behind and they really would gouge out the soil. Now, if you set the tines closer together, theoretically you could rake up a few rocks. Uh, in our situation, you'd get about 10 feet and have to carry off a truckload of rocks. Uh, but um, uh, the other thing that we use though is a chain harrow. And it's basically like a, a heavy duty chain link fence, maybe five feet wide, eight feet long, laying on the ground, heavy, pretty heavy duty. Sometimes we put weights on it, but it'll have um, flexible moving little spikes uh, out, out the bottom too. But it does kind of float across the ground. And we've, we've harrowed fields that had Romer's fescue in it that was maybe the size of softballs and uh, with, without sort of pulling them out of the ground, right? Uh, and, um, but it's a technique that we have used with chemical application where you want to stir things up for the weed seeds that are still in the soil bank in the seed bank um, and to get them to germinate so you can kill them through cover cropping or mowing or what have you. And then you have to deal with, well, is it annual or is it perennial? And you have different techniques for that. Right now we've got a field to the north of our campus. If you come by and, and give me a holler, we can safely go out there together at a distance and uh, show you what we where we've been cover cropping to have, um, uh, in the in the fall, we use uh, European peas, Austrian peas, and in the spring we use buckwheat. And uh, this year we're going to try once again. We had good success with um, uh, camelina, like camel i n a camelina. It's one of the brassicas, and it produces actually over two times the amount of oil per acre that uh, canola does, and it's a direct relative. But uh, it really worked well the one time we did it for allowing weeds to germinate, but then choking them out and preventing a majority of them from going to seed. So harrowing is usually something used in, in that regard to stir up seeds in the seed bank, get them a little sunshine and, and uh, bring them up from two inches down up to a half an inch and, and see if we can get them to germinate for the purpose of killing them. <laughs> okay, uh, Castilea, uh, golden paintbrush. Uh, there was a recovery initiative funded by US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and PRI has been the administering organization for that for the past, let's say seven years or so, give or take a year. And um, that means that they deal with one partner, us, and then sub out to six other partners uh, that we have proposed to them, but they have also uh, proposed to us and jointly agreed upon. These are the agencies that can have the biggest impact for encouraging private and public land planting of golden paintbrush. The mm -hmm. ultimate goal, once it, it came onto the Washington's uh, endangered species list as a threatened species, uh, was to achieve 20 populations, and I'll explain what a population is, uh, 20 separately managed and physically separate populations of golden paint, flowering golden paintbrush um, for a minimum of five years. And uh, then they could take it, delist it, so to speak. Now there's, since we're at 14 to 16, give or take, you know, there's talk, well, should we delist it now? And I always go back to thinking, well, well we got 99% of the polio we eradicated and then put it on cruise control mm -hmm. instead of running through the finish line. Uh, so we'll see what happens here. Obviously money is the big 
the big issue. But uh, we work with partners throughout the sound and we get some funding, they get some funding and PRI gets the uh, administrative costs of the funding that goes to the others. So that's a, a nice benefit to us. But um, we do annual counts, as you can see over here on the left of the golden paintbrush on our site and then facilitate it and or sometimes participate in it on all the other sites that are part of this uh, recovery initiative. And that means putting out tape uh, every meter and walking up and down and counting plants, whether they're 500 plants or 22,000 plants. We have just got to the point now where the last couple of years, we've done a lot of individual plant counting, but we've, all, we've been allowed to do some extrapolating because uh, if the minimum is that a, a, for a site to have a thousand plants average for five consecutive years, well, when you're in the 20,000, it's not really critical if you're at 18,700 or 20,200. But um, so here's the plant off on the right, and it is a hemiparasite. It has hausteria, uh, which are adaptive roots that go to and attach to the roots of other plants, its host plants, which, through which it gets many of its nutrients. And it can survive and does survive. I believe the life, lifespan is shorter, but of an individual plant, but uh, without host plants, but it absolutely thrives with host plants. And these include amongst others, Romer's fescue, yarrow, uh, uh, woolly sunflower, the Oregon sunshine, um, and uh, a few others. And so uh, we also receive funding through U.S. Fish and Wildlife on a separate standalone grant for PRI, as well as uh, equip funding through the United States Department of Agriculture. And all of this has gone into, uh, from the PRI perspective, we're obviously not only about Castilea recovery, golden paintbrush recovery, but it's a great combination because it fits 100% integrates with um, our restoration um, protocol and our, our, um, our mission. Uh, on the ground, as far as golden paintbrush goes, we have uh, these events every once in a while in the summer when we can, didn't have any this year, but uh, wine, cheese, and seeds. And we have a little bit of fellowship and fun out on the prairie. People work for an hour and a half and then uh, uh, we have some good food and drink. And uh, we collect amongst others, the golden paintbrush. This is what the plant looks like when it's gone to seed. Each individual pod has uh, an average, and I guess this is where you use graduate students, but an average of 140 seeds per pod, I've been told. Mm. <laughs> and um, the pods wow. look like this, and the, those are not the seeds that you see in here. These are individual lattice structures that when looked at under a higher magnification are absolutely fascinating, just like anything else is when you, when you get down there with a stereo microscope, right? Um, but the seed is actually inside each one of these lattice structures. And so don't sneeze and uh, don't try to hold them in your hand and walk across from one building to the other because if the wind is two miles an hour, they're gone. Uh, Mm. Bulls like to eat them. I don't see much nutrition in them, but they like to eat them. They also cache them. And so we find yeah. where we know there was no golden paintbrush, all of a sudden 50 meters, you know, there is some 50 meters away from where we have it. And uh, oh, there's a vole trail. Sometimes we find that they'll, they'll cache it and like a squirrel, maybe not remember where they put all of it. But this gives you a perspective on the right of the size of the seed we're dealing with. And in the beginning, we grew it, and you have to start, you have to seed these plug trays in October or November, and then it'll be ready for outplanting the follow October, following October, November. There's a lot of steps, and every step means you can do something wrong or foolish or ignorant and uh, uh, lose part of your population. And um, in any event, they oftentimes look reddish when they start out, and uh, some are green and then they, they turn mostly greenish. And you can see right here is a flower is starting already in the pot. Mm -hmm. But critical time on these is May, June, July, and August when you're still having to keep them and manage them before putting them out because 
Uh, we don't get a lot of rain, so you have to watch water and not do too much top watering because you want the roots to go down. But now we have enough golden paintbrush on our site, which is the, now the third largest population in existence. Um, and it really basically only grows in British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. But uh, uh, we have enough on our site and it's relatively easily collected and uh, processed into seed that we don't grow it in nursery beds. Um, there is an increasing demand for it and we hope that by next year we'll be able to uh, sell it. Um, there's debate from the US Fish and Wildlife people on whether or not we could legally sell it now. Uh, frankly, I've asked them, why don't they pick five or 10 uh, landowners or what have you that have demonstrated responsibility and a deep interest and a, a good level of competence in doing things like this uh, and let them start to get it. Don't you want it all over the place and, and growing and, and decentralized, so to speak? And uh, the answer I've gotten is that, well, no, right at this stage, we still want to know where it all is. So anyhow. <laughs> uh, hmm. uh, so uh, I have this beautiful chart where the bar, or bar graph, where each bar graph was a beautiful little golden paintbrush plant and well, I couldn't manipulate it around, so I've got this boring looking thing over here on the left. But we had four flowering plants in 2006 that we could find on the property. Now, in 2007 and eight, we planted a, a total of about 1,200 plugs. In some parts of our site, literally, it was either they liked it or they didn't. And we got like one out of the 100 in one place, and then like maybe 88 out of 100 in another place. And we planted them specifically um, 50 centimeter distances in one meter plots. And so they would be theoretically, I mean, easier to find. Even if they died, you could find the, the little chicken grit that we use on the top uh, is usually still there. So that facilitated counting. Um, so, uh, what happened between 2010 and 2011, uh, 2012 um, is they just finally, maybe there were some good wins at the perfect time. And uh, we had some, you know, just some great, uh, great success uh, through that. And, and they were very robust and, and they really took off. In 13, 14 and 15, there was a definite dip. And we, we think that that's attributable to a large deer population. They do love to browse this uh, and also voles. And then uh, it has just taken off since then. Uh, we've sort of plateaued the last couple of years around 22,000, but this year, uh, this last fall and this coming fall, we will be heavily seeding uh, five, six, seven, uh, Eight, eight acres with more, maybe even nine or 10 with go more golden paintbrush seed. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, some hope there. Interestingly enough, the deer browsed these back in one of our denser population areas, but they got it so early and seemed to lose interest or something that it all came back and flowered. And in fact, uh, Anecdotally, uh, some of our restoration ecology advisors uh, think that that browsing actually created more flower heads and more seeds. Uh, interesting, but that's uh, all the statistics and the money and the blood, sweat and tears aside, this is, this is what we're shooting for. Uh, it does look kind of like a monocrop, but there are about uh, 40 other species of native plants in there. Part of the issue is that they bloom at different times but this was a good time to get golden paintbrush photos. And you see some chocolate lilies in the foreground here, mm -hmm. but- uh, That's beautiful. Yeah, so we have a couple of miles of trails, um, tours, group activities. Love to have anybody out, even in this COVID time. Um, we, our level of our risk tolerance is that if a, a couple or a family or a single person wanna come out, and um, we can walk far enough apart from one another. And I've got a big loud voice. So uh, we're happy to walk out to a prairie or show you around and um, you know, keep, our, keep our good distance. 
and uh, give you a rain check on tea uh, for post COVID. <laughs> so, and, and the other thing is that if